Hi, I'm Steve Penn from Prism Sound. This is part of a series of quick start guides and this one concentrates on the Titan control panel software. The Prism Sound Titan is a multi-channel USB audio interface providing excellent quality inputs and outputs of music and sound recording. The software is used to change settings and view metering and status on the Titan when it's connected via USB. You would use the software to set input and output line-up levels, mic pre-levels and settings. It can also provide low latency mixes for monitoring as well as allowing you to make some custom routings. Most things in this tutorial apply to our Lyra and Atlas interfaces as well as Titan. Their control panels have much the same features, however the number of channels may differ and in the case of Lyra 1 there are less digital I.O. and sync options. The Titan is connected to my computer, so let me close this and I'll open the software from this shortcut. First let's look at some of the general unit options around this top section here. Sample rate. Titan supports sample rates between 44.1 and 192 kilohertz. When being used with the DAW software like Nuendo, Pro Tools, Logic, etc., the DAW will control the sample rate and will switch the Titan depending on its own project settings. Sync source. This setting needs to be considered if you're connecting to other equipment using digital audio connections. One unit needs to be master sync and all others should be clocked to one of the master's digital outputs. The local setting is for internal clock, otherwise Titan can be clocked from any of the digital inputs or the word clock input. Buffer. Here there's a difference between the Mac version and the PC. The Windows control panel has a setting for the ASIO buffer size. On the Mac, buffer size is usually set from inside the DAW software you're using. As this is a quick guide, we'll skip over the other options in this area. These are explained in detail in the manual. The rest of the control panel has a number of tab buttons, like so. which open up more panels. The most important of these are the input and output tabs and we'll start by looking at these. The input tab. The input tab shows a vertical strip for each of the inputs. You can see they're labelled AI1, AI2, this is analog input 1, analog input 2. Over here we have digital input 1 and 2. Titan uses the same kind of abbreviation throughout the control panel to identify input and output numbers. Titan has eight analog inputs, two digital inputs, and if it's enabled, although this is currently not enabled, it can have up to eight ADAT inputs. We'll look at the ADATs later. Four analog inputs on the Titan have a combo connector which accepts either an XLR from a mic source or a TRS balance jack from a line level source. Inputs 5 to 8 are TRS jack only, and therefore they're line level input. Analog inputs 1 and 2 have the third option of unbalanced instrument level input on the front panel. The source selector on the multi-input channels is automatic. So here I am plugging in a jack on the front panel, and it switches to instrument. Plugging in a jack on the rear panel and it switches to line. An XLR on the rear panel and it switches back to mic. When the mic is selected, you can click on this button and it gives you the option of the pad input. The pad input has a 20 dB attenuation. You can hear I've got much quieter. There we go. That's useful for really close mics on loud sources. So the next option down is the overkiller. This is a progressive limiter which can protect against input overload by a margin of up to 10 dB. When the OVK button is enabled on the channel, the LED in the strip and on the front panel lights up to show that the overkiller has triggered. Notice that it won't show immediately when you enable it, only when it's triggered like so. The 48 volt button enables phantom power on that input for microphones that need it. The filter button allows for an 80 Hz high pass filter or for inputs 1 and 2 there's the option of a RIAA curve for recording direct from record decks. There's some information in the manual about connecting record decks.
This one is a phase button, just switches the phase of the input. You've got a fader on mic inputs, whoops, and you can see the, the OVL light lights up when the input is overloaded. Line inputs over here are at a choice of two fixed levels, normally called plus four and minus ten. Plus four is usually suitable for professional equipment. Zero dBFS is the equivalent analog level of plus eighteen dBU. The, the minus ten setting, which is for more domestic equipment, zero dBFS is plus six dBU. The digital input has a choice between SPDIF input on the RCA phono connector or the TOS optical input. These two other buttons are actually lights which show the condition of the digital input. When the U-lock is lit, there's no digital audio signal on the input, usually like now when it's not connected or it's a bad cable. Async will light when the carrier is there but is out of sync, i.e. you've got a sample rate mismatch or the sync is not set correctly. So now let's look at the outputs tab. Again we have strips for each output, AO1, AO2, analog output 1, analog output 2, digital outputs 1 and 2 here. Titan has 8 analog outputs, 2 digital outputs and the option of 8 ADAT again. Also over here under this strip there's a headphone output pair. Like the inputs, each strip has a meter and a OVL light for overloads. The analog outputs again have the similar line output setup level, plus four and minus ten. The digital output has a switch to choose between AES and SPDIF. It may not be terribly important, but the formats are more or less the same. Channel status bits will be different, but most equipment can accept both. The switch just allows for receiving equipment that prefers one format over the other. There are three important sets of configuration buttons. Here we have the volume buttons. So each strip has one of these. Clicking on it make, turns it green. Let's set that one. And this enables the volume control here. Same as the knob on the front panel. By default, and with vol disabled, each output is at the full level determined by the plus 4, minus 10 switch. But once you've enabled these vol buttons, it allows you to attenuate the level. So for instance, if you're connecting direct to a set of active speakers on analog outs 1 and 2, it gives you a means to change the listening volume. Pressing the volume knob will mute the channels that are enabled this way, and the LED ring around the knob on the front panel flashes. Another important configuration button here is the headphones button, this one here. By default, the headphones are just another stereo pair of channels. They're shown as headphones 1 and 2, or channels 11 and 12 in your DAW, and you can select them from the DAW if you want to monitor on the headphones. However, this button, the headphones button, on the second row up of the outputs tab allows you to change things so that the headphones become like a clone of one or more of the other outputs. In practice it can be quite useful, particularly if you're working on your own, to clone AO1 and 2, like so, to the headphones by pressing this button to give the alternative option of monitoring on headphones. Atlas and Titan have two separate headphone outs, but these are fed from the same output of the DAW. There are two volume knobs to allow each listener to set their own level, but otherwise the signal to the headphones is the same. So, this other configuration button, I'll, I'll call this for now the DAW mixer button. There are some other options, but the two most important are the DAW and mixer settings. When an output pair is set to DAW, it's fed directly from whatever you are sending to that output from the DAW software. When it's set to mixer, 
the mixer tab for that output pair, AO1 and 2, now comes alive. Once again, you can see there's a strip for every input on this. Analog in 1, digital in 1 and 2 here. This DA1, DA2 strip is the feed to that output pair from the DAW. This right side fader here is the master fader for this mixer. The important thing is that the routing from the inputs to the output is direct and there's not the delay that you would expect if the signal is monitored through the computer and its buffers. So you have a level, you have a pan, let's pan that centrally so my voice is now going to both channels. You have a solo and a mute button for each input channel. And the stereo button up sets the pair to be controlled by a single fader, mute or solo button. You can also use these mixers to provide a standalone routing from input to output, for instance to provide a D to A or A to D conversion for some other device. For instance, let's use AO7 and 8 as a DA converter. So I select that panel, I set it to be mixer over here and we'll connect the digital input directly to, to the analog 7 and 8. So we make DA1 and 2 stereo and we solo it. Now the only thing that comes through that mixer is the input from digital input 1 and 2 and it goes directly to analog output 7 and 8. You do have to be a little bit careful about this because now analog 7 and 8 won't accept anything from the DAW up the USB until you change that routing. They're currently set to accept only what's coming from the digital input. And let's have a quick look at what happens when you enable ADAT. Let's switch to ADAT 8. Disappears momentarily. And then the panel comes back. Now you get the ADAT meters on the input and outputs tab and you also get a mixer tab for every ADAT output pair. Um, I would suggest you don't do this if it's being used by some DAW software. They don't usually like a device to change the numbers of channels. Close the software first. The ADAT inputs and outputs have similar controls to the to the other inputs and outputs. For instance, we've got the ULOC and Async lights to show the condition of the signal coming up the ADAT. And we have overload and meters for each ADAT channel. On the outputs, we have, although it's not big enough to show the vol legend, this is a vol button as well. And headphone buttons. We've got the option of DAW mixer on each of the ADAT channels as well. With ADAT, you get eight channels at 44.1 or 48K, only four channels at 88.2 or 96K. Having configured the unit with these volume headphone mixer and other settings, you might be inclined to save the settings so that you can reload them at some other time. So, so we have a red button that saves a configuration and the orange will allow you to load it back. Also, when you're happy with the configuration, it's a good idea to put the unit into standby and back on again using the button at the right side of the front panel. When the unit goes into standby, all the internal settings are saved and this is how it will come back after a complete power down. I hope this has been useful. There's more detail in the help file that's open from the question mark button. There are FAQs on the website. You can ask us questions by using the tech support form on our website. Bye for now.